Hey everybody, it's Lon Seibin. It's time once again for your weekly wrap up. Merry Christmas and Happy Hanukkah to you all. Here are all of the topics we're going to discuss today, including my thoughts on the latest Star Wars movie, but don't worry, there will be no spoilers, so let's get to it. Now, before we begin, I want to thank our newest supporters here on the channel. They include Chris Allegretta, who once again re-upped his gold membership. Hubert Banas and Stacey Alexandria contributed via donor box. We have three new YouTube members, Ron Ridley, Spuds, and Matthew Stevenson. And we have Chris Griffin, who contributed via the Brave browser. And then on our super chat list this week from the live streams, we have Chris Griffin, Carol Cherminsky, Stan Sprinkle, Fernie Lopez, Rup Sakar, Vinny T, Matthew Stevenson, and Zam. And I want to thank everyone who made a contribution this week, along with everyone who's been contributing on an ongoing basis and everyone who watches on a regular basis too, because all of those things equal channel growth. So let's take a look now at the week in review. We did four live streams this week as I was doing some of my video shoots and you can check them all out on the link that you see on screen. Uh, it's been fun to hear feedback on those. People like to see how I put the videos together so you can see me actually shooting them in real time and then compare that to what uh, the final output is. On the Extras channel, we had some unboxings that came out of those live streams, including my new gaming laptop that we'll be reviewing after the holidays. Uh, also, the unboxing of the Blackmagic ATEM Mini, which is a great little video switcher that just came out, and the Shuttle XPC Slim, which is a fanless U-Series powered uh, little mini PC. And then on the main channel, we reviewed the CalDigit Tough Nano, the 8-Bit Doe Zero 2, which is a tiny little game controller, and that new ATEM Mini video switcher. And I really think that video switcher is a pretty big deal given what it can do for a very low price, 295 bucks, and it has built-in chroma key along with a bunch of other features as well. Again, you can see all of these videos linked down below in the master playlist. And in the news this week, we lost a couple of people who had some pretty significant impacts on the personal computing industry. Uh, the first is Chuck Peddle, uh, who was one of the key people behind the 6502 processor. According to Team6502.org, he was working at Motorola and thought their 6800 chip cost too much. He had some ideas to make a lower cost chip. Motorola rejected his idea and he went off and created the chip with his own company and took a bunch of people with him to design it. That chip went on to power the Apple II, the Commodore 64, the Atari 2600, the NES, the TurboGrafx-16. The numbers of uh, machines that came out of that chip are quite substantial and there is no doubt the 6502 has had an impact on your life uh, if you are watching this channel. So uh, we want to send our best to his family and thank him for the contributions he made to making all of this stuff we use every day possible. Uh, another person who passed away had an equal amount of significance to the development of the world as we know it. Uh, Randy Seuss was one of the inventors of the computer bulletin board system. He wrote the very first piece of BBS software. Uh, and he also died a little bit earlier this week. Uh, there is a documentary that we're going to talk about that he appears in. I believe that a picture of him is from that documentary here in the New York Times, and we'll talk a little bit more about the significance he made in just a few minutes when we get to the pick of the week. And in other news, the advertiser-supported video on-demand market that we've been covering here on the channel is continuing to find new outlets. Big Screen, which is a popular VR video app, will be welcoming Paramount Pictures content to their platform. Uh, these will be advertiser supported and free to watch and it looks like they're going to be 3D movies that you'll be able to watch inside of the big screen virtual theater and have friends come with you to watch them together with you there so that's pretty cool and it really goes to show you that the uh, AVOD business is growing substantially and it also looks like 3D movies might still have a home somewhere uh, because of course everything in VR is 3D. I'm eager to try this out on my Oculus Quest. And now it's time for me to talk about Star Wars and in talking about it I am not going to spoil the new movie that just came out, The Rise of Skywalker. I did see it on Friday night. Uh, what I do every time a new Star Wars movie comes out is that I get together with a bunch of my friends and we rent out an entire theater to ourselves, all 160 of us, and we did that 
on Friday night. It was a great time. Everybody enjoyed the film. Uh, from my little poll within the group there, I think everyone liked this film better than The Last Jedi, so it was well received, and I think people walked away uh, satisfied with what they put together here. And of course, J.J. Abrams did a nice job on the film because he's good at this kind of pop culture stuff. All that said, I think Disney really had a impossible task that they could never really achieve, and they didn't make a lot of good decisions along the way to even try to make this work. Uh, let's first start off, though, with the amount of content that Disney has put together for Star Wars over the last four years. Remember, it was only four years ago that The Force Awakens was released. Since then, they had four additional films, including one year where they had two films, which was a total disaster. And I think part of the problem here is that Disney bought Lucasfilm from George Lucas for north of $4 billion, and they had to make back that investment. And as such, they had to put a lot of content out there to try to get some of that revenue back in to pay for what they purchased. And that's why we got all of these movies. And I think the problem, though, is that the Star Wars feature films have always thrived on their scarcity partly because when they first came out, they were impossible to make. The first film in particular pioneered a host of new special effects that have kind of stuck with the industry to this day. It was so groundbreaking, so different. Audiences were totally blown away by what they put together there because it was just something nobody had ever seen before. And I think the public really appreciated how hard these films were to make because in addition to all the hype around the movie, uh, people were curious as to how they did it. And there was a whole bunch of content on television with behind the scenes and stories written up in newspapers and magazines about the gargantuan effort that went into this film. It was so new and different that no studio really wanted to fund it and George Lucas pretty much found a way to pay for it himself, and that was a pretty wise decision in the end. Uh, and it just goes to show you that corporations will always play it safe, and even back in the 70s they were playing it safe, which is why nobody really wanted to fund Star Wars, uh, but George Lucas thought he could make it work. And what's happened since then is that we've gotten movies that uh, appeal to what studios believe they know will work, and they largely have. And unfortunately, what fans want is not profitable compared to what a general movie kind of movie will deliver for the studios. And let's have a look at an example of that. So Rogue One, I would say, is a real fan movie. This was something that was set in the original Star Wars universe, the, the regular mainline trilogy. It was set pretty much right before A New Hope, the movie that started it all. Uh, the setting, the scene, the characters, the set pieces, all of it was from that film and it was just a very comfortable place to be because we all knew it so well, but it was a new story with new characters told within that universe. Fans largely enjoyed that film. Uh, they did make some changes before release to put more of Darth Vader into it and everything, and uh, it was just a complete fan favorite. Of course, there's going to be fans that didn't like it, but by and large, Fans loved it. It made a billion dollars. Now, if we look at what Disney brought in with The Force Awakens, it was a very different story. That film, which came out the prior year, uh, did double that amount at the box office. Two plus billion dollars worldwide versus about a billion with the fan film. And of course, if you're Disney looking at this, you're going to make more of this versus more of the fan stuff. And I have no doubt that Rogue One was kind of like a test market to see how much they could get from fans if they put together a blockbuster size retro film. And clearly the uh, sequel trilogy here, written the way it was with the characters they had and, and you know, kind of directed the way that they directed them, uh, certainly was more successful financially, even though the fans were not as pleased with The Force Awakens as they were with Rogue One. Now you might be thinking, well, okay, what about The Last Jedi? Well, The Last Jedi did better than Rogue One as well. 1.3 billion at the box office. And this is actually, I think, pretty good for a sequel of a super huge blockbuster film. I don't think The Empire Strikes Back did as well against the original Star Wars by comparison. Uh, so for all the vitriol over this movie, uh, it actually did better than the fan movie did, uh, even though fans were d disappointed and upset and alienated by what the things that they did in the film. I was not as offended by this movie as others were. I don't like some of the choices they made. I thought Luke could have been a stronger character. And I think this movie really kind of sums up the challenges that Disney created for the writers and directors because they wanted something new, but they had to keep the old stuff here to attract the audiences. And as a result, the old characters who were superheroes in the first three films are kind of 
relegated off to the side and not doing all that much and uh, feeling sorry for themselves. Now, if I was in charge, and I'm sure they hear a lot about this from people like me, uh, but if I was in charge, I would have released these films in a different order than what they ended up doing. So I would have started with Rogue One versus The Force Awakens. And the reason is, is that if you want to get the fan base on board with your corporate takeover, give them something that they'll love. And there's no question if Rogue One was the first film that Disney made, fans would have eaten it up probably more so than they did a year after The Force Awakens because it was set in a very familiar place. It was a true retro movie with new characters. It did, I think, an exceptional job of recreating that familiar environment of the original films. And it could have been able to help the sequel trilogy be very different. Remember, George Lucas wanted each of these trilogies to be its own thing. And I think the sequel trilogy ended up being more of a sequel to the original three than it was something that kind of stood on its own from a tone and a character standpoint. Uh, what they could have done here was said, hey, you know what, we're gonna do some new stuff, but we're gonna put these retro movies in between so you, everyone gets what they're looking for. Uh, and the result was they just totally botched everything. So what they could have done again is had Rogue One be Rogue One. The Force Awakens they could have created in a, in a time further away than when this story started. So as opposed to being 30 or 40 years since the Return of the Jedi, they could have maybe had it be centuries later or maybe a century later where all the mainline characters are dead and Force ghosts but around. Uh, and that would have certainly given the audience a little bit more satisfaction because, yeah, they're dead. They can't be around all the time. Uh, you could have built up these new characters in a way that I think would have been better and more new. Uh, and it would have, I think, probably been a more compelling sequel to the original trilogy. And I also think what they should have done with the sequel trilogy was have a single writer and director for all three. I thought it was a mistake from the get-go when they had this disjointed thing of, this one doing this film, and then Ryan Johnson doing the second one, and then they had the third guy that they fired doing the third one, and then they brought J.J. back. Uh, I don't know if the story was ever consistent between these films with three very different people uh, helming all of them, and it would have been better to have, I think, Ryan Johnson maybe doing a brand new story that was set further in the future with these new characters where you had a plan and an arc from the beginning to the end, and I don't think anyone from Disney has ever said that they did have that arc uh, even before they fired everybody. So I think the, the movie that we ended up getting this week uh, was probably very different than what they initially envisioned it to be. And who knows what it would have been, again, given the fact that there were so many different people working on it. Uh, if they had done the, the sequel trilogy like the other two trilogies had been done with a single creative boss, I think things could have been a little better. Uh, than where they ended up. Again, I'm not, I'm not hating it. I just think it, was, it could have been better than what they did. And then they could have peppered in these retro films in between. They could have brought Mark Hamill in for a Luke Skywalker movie or something to kind of fill in the gaps that they created with this 100-year you know, difference in story timeline or something. And I think it would have worked much better for the fans. It would have been good for the general audiences who would have had some familiar faces yet get a new story and all would have been great. But of course, Disney being Disney, they've got to keep making money. So they're going to keep making content and they can, I think, redeem themselves to some degree. Uh, so let's take a look at some predictions that I'm going to make. This one I think I'm going to be right about because it's already happening. Uh, we're going to see a lot of fan-friendly, lower-cost productions on Disney+. Plus. Uh, the Mandalorian is very successful. Uh, the last episode, I believe, is airing this Friday. I loved it. Uh, it's, it's like the perfect Return of the Jedi sequel because it's new characters. It's happening within the universe. So the things that occurred in that movie will be kind of coming into the storyline. It's just working great for me. I loved what they've done with every episode just about. There's a couple episodes that weren't great, but overall it is a A-plus production here, and I think we're going to see more of that. Uh, there's an Obi-Wan series coming out very shortly. And for Disney, this is great because the financial risk is really not there. So long as they can retain and attract new subscribers, uh, these things make a ton of sense to pour money into. And they're evergreen. They will continue, continually add value to the service. Um, so there's really no downside for Disney to produce this fan favorite Star Wars content. And given that they can be the exclusive home of that, uh, that certainly will drive more subscriptions. So we're going to be seeing a lot more of that. I also believe they will have a Ray, Finn, and Poe feature film. 
uh, because they have developed a pretty significant fan base out there with general audiences, and uh, they have quite a mess to clean up now after the last film, so there'll be no doubt uh, something with the three of them, I think, as their own standalone sequel trilogy. Even though they say this saga's over, that saga with the Skywalkers might be, but those three are still young enough, I think, to deliver more money to the mouse. So I think we're going to be seeing more of that. And I hope if they do make a feature film trilogy with these three, that the same director is working on it with them, uh, because that was really the shortfall of the uh, uh, sequel trilogy we just got. And finally, I think we're going to get some kind of Luke Skywalker film with Mark Hamill. Uh, you know he'll do it. Uh, you know that the Star Wars management wants to win back these fans, and I think Luke's role in this sequel trilogy is probably the most controversial. Uh, so we're going to see something, I think, that'll take place in the 40 years between the Return of the Jedi film and the, uh, the sequel trilogy at some point. And I'm hoping that they do it soon before uh, Mark Hamill gets too tired or something, because he would be great in a film on his own, and it would be great to get that Luke Skywalker film we all wanted after Return of the Jedi ended. So those are my predictions. Let me know what you think uh, down below in the comments section, because this is going to be our Q&A for you. Uh, please try to avoid spoilers in your comments because not everyone has seen the movie yet. Uh, so we got another couple of days before we can really start openly talking about it. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on the trilogy and whether or not you think that perhaps they should have done some things differently to really make a sequel trilogy more successful. Uh, let me know down in the comment stream. And now it's time for a Q&A from you, the viewers. And in light of the recent passing of Randy Seuss, one of the inventors of the computer bulletin board system, I have this question here from the off-grid Aussie prepper. Uh, he discovered a while ago the eight-episode documentary on bulletin board systems created by Jason Scott. And that documentary is available at the link that you see on screen. And you can see them interviewing uh, Randy Seuss right there. And the off-grid prepper was wondering if this was something that uh, I saw, first of all, and I definitely watched it. And he was also wondering if it was in line with my experiences back when I was an active bulletin board system user. And it absolutely was. If you really want to get a sense as to what kind of predated everything that we do online, uh, check out this documentary. It is fascinating stuff if you haven't already seen it. And another thing that's related to that is my pick of the week this week, because we picked the documentary a number of years ago as a pick of the week. Uh, but there's a, another one out recently called The Lost Art of Wares, and you can find more information on it linked here. Uh, this is about a 30-minute documentary detailing a lot of the ANSI artwork that people were doing on these bulletin board systems, and it's definitely worth taking a look at. Uh, they did do a segment of the BBS documentary on this ANSI artwork, uh, but this is such an extensive topic that I think the art of wares really fills in a lot of gaps there. So check out both uh, if you're interested in computer history and learning more about what it took to create bulletin board systems back in the day. Now, last week when I was talking about the new Xbox, I mistakenly called it the Xbox One Series X, when in fact, according to Billy Forrest here, it's going to be called just the Xbox Series X. And I found an article uh, related to this whole thing on uh, the gamesindustry.biz website, uh, where it's talking about how Microsoft is trying to have a more simple branding strategy around the Xbox, and that the Series X is not the brand, but Xbox will be. But I am concerned with this name that next holiday season when this thing comes out, a lot of parents and grandparents are going to be buying their kids Xbox One Xs because they think they're buying the Series X, which I have no doubt will be in very short supply. Uh, so I'm hoping that, uh, first of all, kids who are putting this on their Christmas list will be able to properly communicate to their parents what to be looking for. Uh, but also, hopefully, Microsoft might do a little bit more to differentiate the consoles from each other because there's no doubt uh, Xbox Series X is going to be confused with Xbox One X for consumers that are not following things too closely. So we'll have to see how this plays out, but I have no doubt we'll have a news story at this time next year about the fact that a couple of kids got an Xbox One X versus the Series X, uh, but we'll have to see how all of this comes together as they start putting the uh, new console marketing plans in place. I will say, though, that I'm not hearing a lot of controversy about it, uh, and generally, of course, gamers are uh, probably the most scrupulous consumers out there, and it looks like people are pretty satisfied with the specs that Microsoft has announced with this console. I'm eager to try one out, too. I think it's going to be a very nice, low-cost living room PC, 
And I think we're finally getting to that merger point, folks, that I wrongly predicted would happen this year. Let's stay tuned for that. Now, these next two questions came in via Twitter because it looks like LastPass has been acquired yet again. So if you recall, a couple of years ago, LogMeIn bought LastPass. After that sale, the price of LastPass went from like 12 bucks a year to $36 a year. Uh, but largely that password management service has remained the same for the people using it. I haven't seen anything really different about it uh, beyond the higher price. But now it looks like, according to the Tan Man and uh, GNT00, uh, LastPass's parent company, LogMeIn, is in the process of being acquired by a private equity firm. And there's some concern as to what's going to happen with user data in this purchase. Now, I'm not as concerned with the user data component so much as I am the future of the company. Uh, because typically, when one of these private equity deals goes down, the deal itself is financed by the company. The company basically takes out a loan uh, against itself to finance the purchase by the private equity firm and they have to raise more money to pay down the debt and still be profitable, which means there's no doubt the cost of LastPass is going to go up along with other LogMeIn services uh, if this deal goes through. So buckle up for that. And this might be a good opportunity for other password services perhaps to uh, offer some better deals. Um, but from a security standpoint, I am not as concerned because no one at LastPass has your data. They've got a blob of encrypted stuff but they can't unlock it because it's all encrypted on the client side where you are. Um, so it's not likely there's, there's going to be any real privacy issues here with this acquisition. I think it's going to be uh, mostly on the cost front. And it's unfortunate too, because LastPass really began as an independent company that was trying to do things right. And now I'm really getting concerned that it's just going to be another piece of the corporate machinery that uh, if it's not generating enough money, perhaps the quality declines or they'll just keep raising the prices to a point where uh, general consumers can't get access to what, what I think is probably the best security tool on the market. So we'll keep an eye on what's happening in the next year here. Uh, but on the surface, this does not sound like good news for LastPass users. And I'd love to hear some suggestions as to what password managers you're using in case I decide to jump ship sometime in the future. Now, this next question comes in from Doug Hart. Looking ahead to 2020, what's the likelihood of either 5G or satellite competing with cable for home internet service? And I would say in the coming year, not likely, but it's possible we might start seeing some of these 5G services become an alternative, provided they don't have restrictive data caps. And I think the satellite services that are launching right now, namely the SpaceX service, will be very attractive to people in more rural areas. But I'm not sure the upstream bandwidth is going to be close to what you might get with a Comcast connection, for example. And this is because these are wireless networks and they're going to have a lot of users hitting them. And I'm not sure they're going to be able to keep up with a tremendous amount of demand, especially on the upstream side. Downstream, we might be okay with. I did do a little research, though, on what 5G is looking like so far, because, of course, these satellite services are not yet available to the public. Uh, speedtest.net has a blog post from August, which isn't all that long ago, uh, looking at some of the speeds they're experiencing on 5G networks throughout the country. Now, they're using the uh, Snapdragon X50 on a mobile phone, so this is what you would get on a mobile device, but no question if you had something in your house as a gateway, you'd probably be seeing similar speeds. And they're looking pretty good and pretty comparable with what you might see on a cable connection. Uh, so on the downstream side here, you can see on Verizon, they're doing about 870 megabits per second as an average uh, versus 100 on LTE. That's a pretty big bump in downstream speed. Uh, but I'm beginning to discover here that downstream is very easy. The real issue is what you're going to see on the upstream. And also keep in mind as we look at all this stuff is that most people don't have a 5G phone either. So uh, these are networks that are largely not all that saturated yet. So we're probably seeing the best it'll ever be here perhaps in some of these tests. But the upstream is not looking impressive to me. Remember, nobody's on these networks yet. And the best they're getting out of provenance here is 50 megabits per second on the average. Uh, you're occasionally seeing a burst of 133 or so, uh, not substantial. So I'm hoping that if this is what we're going to see out of 5G, uh, this might push the ISPs to improve their uh, wireline upstream speeds, which I think is going to become more and more important as businesses demand more upstream bandwidth for data transmission. And if that's the competitive point here uh, on the upstream, I think we might see a little bit more there. And that's my hope at least, uh, given that I would like to start doing 4K video because I will soon have the equipment to do that. 
and it's taking me forever just to get the 1080p stuff up to you and sent to all the platforms that I distribute to. Uh, and that's certainly going to be a big bottleneck for this business in the next year. So I'm hoping we see more. Heck, I'd even take the 133 megabits per second max here over what I've got now, which is 12. Uh, but nonetheless, I am not that optimistic we're going to see either of these services be uh, competing with ISPs in the short term. Uh, but perhaps the satellite thing might play out. Perhaps the 5G might have some gateway products coming out towards the end of the year. But I'd be seeing us looking at this more around 2022 or so. And then even with 5G, you still have to have a pretty substantial build out because you have to get fiber out to all of those little nodes you're putting everywhere. And that's a very expensive thing to do. So I think it's going to be a lot longer than this, than this coming year. But I think there will finally be some competition soon to the mainline ISPs that have been really holding back broadband speeds for some time now. So this week we've got a bunch of stuff already shot and ready to go because I'm taking a little bit of a break between Christmas and New Year's and I wanted to also let you know that uh, we're going to CES again this year. Uh, we'll be heading down on January 5th and we'll be there for a couple of days. Uh, the plan is to do our usual dispatch videos along with some other fun things I've got planned. Uh, we have a new sponsor this year as well, so we'll have some different things with them. Uh, so it's going to be a fun run. I hope to get some feedback from all of you before I go as to what you want me to look out for. Uh, so do let me know. Uh, because of the trip and my little break here, there's likely not going to be a wrap-up until probably the second week of January. Uh, but I will have a lot of content going up on the usual schedule in between. So don't worry, you will certainly see me, just not a wrap-up video until uh, probably again the second week of January. Uh, but while I am resting, we will be taking a look at a couple of different things. We got in the new uh, Yoga C940 the other day from Lenovo. This has got the new Intel 10th generation processor on board with those Iris graphics. So we'll be putting that to the test very shortly. Uh, we're going to have a sequel to my free TV video. I found five more free services to talk about that give you uh, some top level content for no money, just some ads in most cases and a few that don't have any ads at all. Uh, we'll also have my monthly sponsored video from Plex and this month we're going to look at uh, running a Plex server on a lower cost NAS combined with the NVIDIA Shield as the transcoding server. So in other words, the concept here is that you've got stuff on a cheap NAS for storage, but the Shield is your server and pulling the media over the network. So we're going to demonstrate how to set that up and uh, do some performance tests on that. So be on the lookout. That's coming up this week. Uh, we're going to have my retro review, hopefully. I've been trying to get to this, and I haven't had like a good three hours to work on it, but it will be soon. Uh, what we're going to do this year is explore some computers that I used to use as a kid on the Mister, along with some of the original disks that I have converted over to the Mister. So that might be a fun little thing to uh, take a look at. That's coming up later this week. And then if you want to support the channel, you can. You can go to lon.tv support and make a monthly or a one-time contribution to the channel. Uh, we also support the YouTube membership program. A lot of you have been signing up for that. And if you join, you get these cool little icons next to your name as you comment and chat with me. So that's a fun thing. Uh, we also have our ongoing relationship with Plex, where you can sign up for a free Plex account, no credit card required. And we will get a little commission for that. Uh, also, you got a, a day until Christmas or so, so you can gift a Plex Pass to someone in your life by hitting that link on screen or buying one for yourself. We have other channels that you can find me on, including my extras channel for unboxings and supplementary content. We have the podcast, which is an audio version of this show. The Snippets channel has portions of this show that we pull out in search-friendly uh, formats for easy finding later. Uh, we have the live stream archive, which we talked about at the outset here. And then we have my Amazon page. And if you go to that and you follow me there, you can be notified when I do live streams on Amazon. So all the live streams we've been doing here on the channel have been simulcasting to Amazon. And if we ever do any unique Amazon content, hitting the follow button there will get you notified of what's going on there. On the YouTube side, you can hit the bell and get notified every time I go live. I rarely schedule live streams. I just kind of pop on. So if you want to get notified when I do pop on, you can do that with the bell icon there. Uh, you can also connect with me with my very infrequent email list, the Facebook page, uh, the Facebook group, which continues to be a great source of content for this show, and it's a great way to connect with all of you. And then, of course, we have my store where I sell previously reviewed items at lower prices than new. And you can find that store uh, at lon.tv store, and then you can get an alert by following this link here. And every time I add something to the store, 
uh, you get notified of that. Good deal there. So if you want to see when uh, the good deals come up, sign up for the email list and you'll get notified. And that is going to do it for this week's weekly wrap up. Have a great Christmas, a great Hanukkah, a great Kwanzaa. Happy New Year. It's been a great year on the channel. I've really uh, enjoyed the last year with all of you, and I'm looking forward to the next one. Uh, please keep those questions and comments coming. I greatly appreciate your viewership, and I just want to thank you all uh, for helping me do something I love every day, and I really appreciate it moving into the new year. Until next time and next year, this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters, the Four Guys with Quarters podcast, Tom Albrecht, Rajesh, Logic GR, and Kalyan Kumar. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.